Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special edition of State of the World. I'm Megan Torrey, the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, and today we are so honored and excited to have with us as our special guest, Minister Alamiri, world-recognized leader in advanced technology and space. Some of you may know that the space sector is an increasing focus of our content here at the World Affairs Council, as so many of our lives around the world are becoming increasingly dependent on space. And the timing of this event is particularly auspicious, right in between Sir Branson and Virgin Galactic and Jeff Bezos and Blue Origins um, launches ushering in a new era of private sector space economy. And at the same time, so many big achievements happening in space, including today, which we'll hear about the UAE's interplanetary expedition, the Mars Hope spacecraft, which as I speak is in orbit around Mars. And so it is such an exciting time to be talking about space. I wanna thank our sponsor today, Raytheon Technologies. And I wanna welcome the World Affairs Councils of America and, and everyone joining us from around the U.S. and around the world. Uh, we have a special uh, guest with us today and a special partner in the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technologies. Um, and I want to bring in uh, the president um, and CEO of CCAT, the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technologies, Ron Angelo, to talk to us a little bit about why the World Affairs Council here in Connecticut has such a um, focus on space. Ron? Megan, thank you very much. It's great to be here today. And it's a tremendous honor to be speaking before the Connecticut World Affairs, Affairs Council and all of you joining us today. Many of you are probably asking, why is the Connecticut World Affairs Council hosting a foreign minister for an insightful conversation on space and technology? Well, it's because from the earliest years of space exploration, Connecticut played a leading role in developing and manufacturing many mission critical systems and has to this day been a hub for research, innovation, development, and, man and advanced manufacturing. The impact of the space industry in Connecticut cannot be overstated and is intrinsically tied to other major industrial sectors in Connecticut, such as aerospace, defense, energy, and emerging technologies. From the endlessness of space to the depths of our oceans, Connecticut's industrial companies have developed critical technologies that support and protect human life in the most inhospitable conditions. The legacy and contributions made by Connecticut companies, such as Hamilton Sunstrand, are marked in history. And today, companies such as Raytheon Technologies, Lockheed Martin, and General Dynamics are leaders in the advancement of space technology. In addition to these global industrial companies, Connecticut is home to several thousand advanced manufacturers comprising one of the most technologically capable and productive supply chains found anywhere in any region around the world. Approximately 200 of these highly capable supply chain companies produce products and services for the space industry. Connecticut's technology ecosystem of innovators, creators, companies large and small, and world-renowned universities not only supports advancements of disruptive and leading edge technologies for space applications, Connecticut's technology ecosystem supports those who dream, those who work passionately and tirelessly to advance technology. In reading about Minister Ella Mary, she quoted as saying, dreaming of going to Mars is easy. Getting there is brutally hard. No great technology advancement is easy. Connecticut businesses know this all too well, yet have forged ahead for centuries and led the world on many fronts. Dreaming of the world's most advanced jet engines is easy. Manufacturing them is brutally hard. Dreaming of the world's most advanced rotorcraft is easy. Manufacturing them is brutally hard. And dreaming of the world's most advanced submarines is easy. Manufacturing them is brutally hard. The greatest technology advancements have no boundaries and cross industry sectors. Yet the advancement of space related technology will set a standard for international collaboration and the Connecticut space industry will be at the center. Thank you. 
Ron, thank you so much. And to introduce our special guest today, I want to bring in Kurt Amend from Raytheon Technologies. Kurt, it's all yours. Thank you, Megan. We're honored today to have her as our featured speaker, Her Excellency Sara Al Amiri, the UAE Minister of State for Advanced Technology and Chairwoman of the UAE Space Agency. What I find striking about her biography is that not only does she bear the responsibilities of leading an important government ministry, uh, in itself a full-time job, um, but also a vital, highly visible government agency that is charting new pathways in space. And her work is at, at the absolute cutting edge of research, development, advanced science and technology. The minister's influence on the UAE's historic transition passage from a free market economy based largely on oil and gas production to a knowledge economy for the 21st century and beyond will be significant and lasting. And so we're very fortunate that she's with us today. Megan, I'd like to just go straight into the first question, if I could. Absolutely. Okay, Minister Alamiri, this year you led the stunning success of the UAE Hope Mars mission on its first attempt. As, as you all know, the mission successfully placed the spacecraft into orbit around Mars, some tens of millions of miles from planet Earth. Um, can you start by telling us why you undertook this mission? When did you first realize that it would be a success? And what were your thoughts before that moment when you saw clearly that it would be successful? Thank you, Kurt, and thank you, Megan. And I'd like to thank everyone at the World Affairs Council, Connecticut, for this invitation uh, to join you on this uh, uh, talk with regards to space and how technology in space advances development forward. Uh, thank you for the question, uh, Kurt. It's quite a large one. Uh, with regards to why the Emirates undertook a planetary exploration mission, why did it move towards um, have, sending a mission to Mars? It's, it, it, it is about pushing the boundaries, increasing the challenges that we are facing, striving to take on more and more risks. Because as Ron said, Businesses and technology are very hard to, to, to get to the point of success. It's very hard to do technology design, development, and manufacturing. And what that requires is a completely different mindset and a completely different risk appetite and risk profile. And with that, taking on a mission and, uh, and transforming an entire economy from a free market economy, as Kurt uh, mentioned to one that is based on knowledge and to one that is based on not utilizing technologies, but rather designing and developing technologies is a completely different paradigm shift for us in the way we work, in the approach of the, the, the diversification of the types of talent that we have within the country and the types of companies that we have within the country. And what that required is sort of like a jump start. One, two, Find a way by which you're able to establish a sector of your economy that doesn't exist before. How do you go about building the expertise when you don't have the company set up in the first place that you want to set up as an overall objective? And that's one of the underlying factors of the Emirates Mars mission in which we undertook a global partnership with the University of Colorado Boulder where our team worked together with the team there to be able to build that experience and expertise. And now we have a model on how do we develop a new sector and capabilities in a new sector when one doesn't exist before. We also looked at the whole aspect of the marriage between scientists and engineers and researchers. Um, and how do you start building and amalgamating those different communities together? And a planetary exploration mission does it very well. And it teaches us different ways to work with different types of talents in the science and tech field. And that was the second objective that, that this mission worked towards and putting together scientists and engineers to work on design and development of an exploration program. The third is stimulating. So we need sustainability, we need long-term impact, we need a continuous influx of talent. Um, sending a mission to Mars actually does that for you. It, it, it transforms and inspires an entire generation. And we've seen that and it's quite palpable, it's quite uh, impactful. The language of the people are speaking, the, um, the way that they address possibilities has transformed and the normalization of STEM as a way of, as a working field and as an area of interest has also created, created such a large impact. In parallel to, um, uh, to all of these three different objectives, at the time that this mission started, um, when, when it was first talked of within, within the Emirates, 
it was late 2013. The region was coming on the back of turmoil. The region was coming on the back of a largely youth population that was frustrated and looking for opportunities. Um, and the UAE is not different uh, with a large portion of the population being under 35 years old. Um, and one of the underlying factors of this mission when we first, all of us, when we first started, we were all under 30 and, and we were tasked with such a, lar a mission that had a risk profile unlike any other ones that we've worked on before. So myself, prior to this mission, I worked on Earth uh, observation satellites. The chances of success there is 95%. Um, you build a spacecraft, you test it. It is difficult, it is challenging. But once you get it on the launch pad, when you've, once you've tested it very well, you've got sort of a guaranteed uh, ticket to space with which you can finish your, uh, your mission. In, in Mars, it was quite a different, um, it was quite a different paradigm shift where we knew early on that our chance of success was 50%. Um, and that just changed the whole aspect of how you tackle risk and how you're able to circumvent that and how do you get to a point where you handle a lot of the unknowns to be able to get to the mission uh, that we've had today. And one question that you asked, Kurt, was when did I feel when did I feel that this was a success? It depends on which objective that you're talking about. Regardless of what we did end to end, uh, and with all the, the thoughts that we had in mind, we never had a guarantee that we're going to reach Mars. But the other objectives did have a large impact. Getting to Mars sort of amplified the impacts of, ch of changing culture, of changing the way we think, the way we work, and so on. Um, when when we're talking about the final moments prior to arriving. Um, it was practically seven years of, uh, of my life sort of running through my head with all the challenges that this mission put us through, just getting to, 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 the, to a chance to get in orbit, to be one of very few countries to be in orbit around Mars. Um, I, 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 Till today, I don't think I have words to describe that feeling, the moments before and even the moments after. But it was quite an interesting endeavor over the course of the last uh, seven years now. So Minister Alamiri, thank you again for being with us. Uh, can you talk briefly about what is happening with the Hope Mars spacecraft now in orbit on Mars? What kind of data is it collecting and how do you foresee that data informing the future of the UAE space program? The objective, the scientific objective of this mission from the get-go was to have a mission that collected novel science data. Uh, and what that meant is that we needed to address questions that haven't been addressed about Mars before. Um, and I think we got an initial taste of what that really means. None of us working on this mission have been put in a situation where you get a piece of data uh, from another planet and a piece of information that only the people that are working on this mission no, from everyone on planet Earth. That's a feeling that it is very hard to describe. Um, although we worked towards that point, but very hard to describe. And we were really grateful to actually get the, uh, the, the capability of imaging the aurora very early on, um, on uh, in the mission. Um, and the data from this mission is coming on according to plans. We are in orbit according to plans. We are imaging the spacecraft exactly according to the plans that are in place. The data is currently being looked at by our science team, ensuring that the processing is working uh, up to par to what, what the science community then expects as data to receive from this mission. Uh, we are planning to release our initial batch of data in the first week of October. Let's talk a little bit about um, the overall sort of objective. So, when discussing the success of the HOPE mission, you've stated that the mission means not only success in the present day, but success for the next 50 years, for the next generation. Can you tell me more about um, how the space domain can, how you vision it transforming the world ahead um, in decades and transforming the future of the UAE? That also, I think, is a multifaceted um, outcome. First on, within the context of the UAE locally, uh, we are seeing, as we've progressed with the development of the mission, even prior to launch, we've seen an increased dialogue on, on uh, where people can work in the science field and more and more possibilities opening up even for natural sciences. We had a natural, if you were in STEM, you would go either into medicine or go into uh, engineering, but it wasn't as diverse of sort of a field as we are today on, on the areas and opportunities of possibility. 
And I think that this mission has created with a lot of the youth is the opportunity to create your own opportunity in the field that you're passionate about uh, and being able to push that forward and, and, and being able to, um, to, to advance a lot of that development to moving forward. Uh, what it means for the UAE globally and for the Emirates globally is increased partnership and inc increased participation on the global realm when it comes to advanced technology, when it comes to the space sector, increasing collaborations, being part of the global value chain, um, ensuring that it's, it's as a whole quite impactful, not only beneficial to the UAE's economy, but beneficial to all the sectors that we're currently working on. And those are the different, the different areas that we're focusing quite a lot of effort in. Uh, be it in technology or in climate change or in the space sector, so that we're able to advance development, uh, not only for our own country or not only for creating an impact in the region, but collectively um, as nations around the world. So let's talk a little bit about the space domain. As you said, it, it's a domain for uh, collaboration. You mentioned the partners that you worked with at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and we know that the heart, the hope, um, the hope spacecraft craft was launched off a Japanese rocket, I think, right? So, um, so definitely has traditionally been a space for collaboration, but with here in the United States, we now have an entire new military branch, Space Force. It can also be seen as a realm of um, competition, right? So how do, you, how do you see the future of that space domain and how do you balance um, those sort of collaborations with that sort of uh, point of competition? Collaboration has been an underlying thread that has that has allowed the space sector to push forward and develop at the rate that it's been able to develop in over the course of the last decades. I foresee that we will continue um, upping the realm of collaboration. Yes, uh, space and space assets is used for security purposes, but it's also more and more used and more and more accessible for our daily lives. And what that really means is that it's going to create a far and wider impact across the different sectors that are non-space sectors, but utilize space assets, utilize the byproducts of space analysis and space data uh, to be able to advance development forward. And the more we make space accessible, the more space data becomes accessible to more nations around the world and to more sectors around the world, the more you will see that, that, that a form of cooperation, regardless of whether or not co competition exists, competition is healthy, competition allows advancement and allows the speed of development, like you mentioned earlier on, with regards to a competition of getting space tourism up and running. It's great, it advances technology at a fast rate, it gets a lot of players in place, but there's always an underlying factor of cooperation that advances the sector as a whole and allows us to percolate across different sectors. And that's where the value really is. That's where the value of what we call the space economy really is. It's in business demand created by other sectors for space products and services. And that's the play that we continue to, to sort of cooperate on, increasing that demand, increase competition, uh, to increase technological advancement, and then create the necessary impact across so many different sectors, uh, which then brings us back to healthier cooperation. Minister, can you describe what it's like to sort of build and create a space program from the ground up? And, and you know, how does that impact your everyday decision making and your vision for the future? Having worked in sort of the ramp up of the UA space program from two early 2009 till today, when you're in the midst of it and working on it, you don't realize what you're really weaving together. Um, what we had in place is an overarching objective. So we needed to develop our science and technology capabilities within the country and reutilize space to do that. So that's what we pegged every single decision to. How much impact is it going to have? How much is it going to um, expand the portfolio of the space sector? And as we continue, we continue to ask ourselves those questions. How do you continuously push the boundaries for, uh, forward and be able to develop uh, the necessary impact um, and, uh, as we are seeing today? How does it feel seeing the results? It's quite surreal, um, but the results always create so many windows of opportunities, um, especially on the back of the Emirates Mars mission successful arrival to Mars. It even opened retrospectively to us where we have to take a moment and pause within the space agency to better understand why are we utilizing space exploration? How are we utilizing space exploration? What objectives does it really achieve? And then how do you create the necessary demand? And how do you then go and support a sustained space, space sector? 
And it's the same space sector. It, it sort of places a burden, right? You created a space program. A lot of people are excited and interested to be part of it within the Emirates. And a lot of countries are interested to participate and to collaborate on various efforts. But how do you ensure all of that is a sustained fabric? It's not something that needs to be stimulated by any one entity. Um, and that's perhaps the biggest challenge that we're facing today. And, and, and uh, I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying together with the Space Agency team answering those questions and setting what is our next phase? What is our transition next phase um, of development? And how does that look like? And how do you translate that into a space program and projects uh, moving forward? Um, it's been quite an interesting 12 years now um, working in the space sector and I'm really looking forward uh, to the next uh, 10 years where an interesting transition will probably take place. So I'm going to bring in a question from Thomas in the audience. Um, the U.S. space program developed so incrementally, um, and your mission sort of leapfrogged and jumped ahead of so many. Um, will the UAE space efforts continue to make jumps, leapfrogs like this, um, such you know, in, in your space per pursuits in the future? So the reason for the for not taking the approach of the organic stepwise developments in our space sector, and actually in a lot of the sectors within the country. This is back in history 50 years ago when this nation was created in 1971, when we didn't have basic infrastructure in place. We didn't have basic education systems in place, um, access to water, access to energy, access to electricity. Um, and getting to where we are today in the number of decades that we did, the only choice we have as a country is to leapfrog. Um, and that continues to be in every single sector. Opportunities will never wait for you. We entered into the space game, into the space uh, uh, sector because it was beneficial. And within the next decade, it's going to become beneficial for your private, uh, impactful economic, creation of economic value. Uh, and, it cre and, it, and there is a lot of opportunities for our private sector to enter into. If we wait for the incremental development, that wave of, of the new space economy would have already passed. That market would have already been saturated. That would be a lost opportunity. And it's the same story that happens across every single sector. So it, it's not because um, we're trying to bypass any step. It's because we don't have a choice except to leapfrog. But do it, doing it, for example, even within the context of the, spa of the space, uh, space sector, when we went from Earth observation to planetary exploration, it was done in a calculated way, although it was a leapfrog, although we, ha we had to take a large risk in taking that leap, um, it was still done in a calculated and measured manner and in a manner to achieve the overall objectives. So let's talk a little bit about the private sector spa space sector industry in UAE. You've, you've said that this could be completely transformational to the economy of the UAE. Can you talk a little bit more about that? In, in, and also talk about how it can inspire and transform next generations in UAE. So coming into the Emirates Mars issue, we wanted to have a factor of getting in some of our industrial players, even if they weren't manufacturing for the space sector to manufacture for, um, um, for the Emirates Mars mission. There are some hardware parts, uh, uh, sorry, some structural parts that, were, that are currently around Mars that were manufactured by UAE-based manufacturers that manufacture parts for aircraft. Uh, prior to this mission. What that allowed us to do is to go into the details of how do I create a new line in our existing industry. So that's the first play that we're looking at is expanding expanding existing industries into the into tapping into the space market. The other one is ones that don't exist today, which is create, creating the, the right ecosystem for design and development firms to work in the area of small satellites, in the area of imaging, uh, in imaging instrumentations, um, that will allow for the, for the advent into the space sector. And then the other underlying aspect that's currently the space sector is working on, there's a lot of data out there from so many different spacecrafts around the world that we haven't been able to analyze all of them. So how do you create the right systems um, based on machine learning, based on artificial intelligence to create the necessary products uh, and services and information that you require to apply to climate change, to apply to climate, to, to apply to um, infrastructure development uh, to completely address uh, the, the topic of uh, food security from, from our perspective and, and advancing farming and new farming methodologies and so on and so forth. So those are the areas that we're currently looking at for um, creating the necessary impact on our private space sector. Thank you so much because I think we often hear about the sort of technical um, 
issues that are going on with space, but I think that there is a whole nother opportunity to talk about using space to its highest power to make the world a better place. So thank you. I wanna bring in a question from Alan. Um, what future programs is the UAE working on? I, I think he means in the space sector currently and who are some of your collaborating partners? I think Alan might want to be a potential collaborator. <laughs> <laughs> Looking forward to, to exploring potential collaborations. As we're moving forward, one of the areas that we're kicking off is uh, increasing the number of entities that are working on um, the what we call the downstream play of space, which is on the uh, utilization of space data to provide products and services for different sectors. And it's through that that we're able to create demand uh, in place. The UAE has undergoing missions in Earth observation and in exploration, and also in um, human um, exploration, uh, human outer space exploration. Uh, but we continue now to focus a part of it, perhaps on an unexciting part, but it's creating more demand for the space sector lo locally. And if I if I pinpoint what's the priority of the space agency over the course of the next two years, it's that it's demonstrating to existing sectors, which are the sectors that I spoke about how we can utilize space technology and space data and space services to be able to address a lot of the challenges that they're facing today. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, I know the next generation of future leaders, how has the space sector changed the opportunities for students, young leaders in the region, um, You know, maybe not only in UAE, but in the entire region? It's changed the dialogue on what it really means to be part of, uh, of any endeavor. Um, and removed sort of the hurdle of the age. Uh, I myself can can speak to the benefits of, of it personally to be to be able to have such a large opportunity. And I work with a lot of people who have gotten a lot of opportunities on the back of the um, space program and on the back of focusing the space program on youth uh, primarily um, and being able to then start working on various uh, sectors. So. It's been an interesting journey, an amalgamation between experience, between utilizing fresh graduates, and 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 coming with the result that we came that that we have today. Um, and I think we'll continue using that. It's, it's proven a good case when you're trying to establish a new sector that doesn't exist before, uh, and bringing in fresh graduates into into the mix and then building their capabilities uh, towards the necessary sector that we want to create an impact in. So. And within the country, and, and like I said, it's a country that large portion of our population is under 35 years old. It's created a lot of opportunities in designing the way we work, designing what the future looks like, and being part of that design process. Can I ask you a question about your leadership? You are world recognized, one of Time's 100 people. You you know, lauded by the BBC. What has it been like um, in your personal leadership journey? What do you want people to know um, as you go, as you know, as they look to you as a role model? It's been the last decade has been a series of opportunities shaped as immense challenges um, that I've been fortunate to be part of. Uh, these so many programs. The biggest that I personally learned on has been a transformational personal journey. I think to me and a lot of people that I've worked on and not only on our end of the world, but also um, our partners uh, and colleagues out of the US. Um, it's just going through such a challenge that wants to transform the way an entire society thinks, an entire approach to failure um, per se, and, and, and being able to embrace working on something that you can never guarantee success for is quite a humbling endeavor up to the point of, of arriving to Mars. I had no guarantee that we were going to get there, although I knew that we've d confidently done everything in our hands um, to, to ensure that we thought of every single worst case scenario, designed that into the development process, to ensure success. That is a very humbling endeavor that you're working on a program for such a long period of time and it takes up a large portion of your lives. And I think everyone here who has worked on a, in, in a space program or a space sector understands that this is sort of a, it's, it's part of your personal life here. Your entire family is part of the journey. And, and to come at the end of it and understand the impacts that it's created, I think it's quite transformation on, on a person. And I'm quite grateful to have been in a position to have this opportunity uh, and to continue it forward and to create, I think what, what I'm interested in today is to create this 
these series of opportunities for others to capitalize on and learn from because it's through strong adversity and challenges that you're able to monumentally grow as individuals and therefore monumentally grow as organizations. Fantastic. It's been such a pleasure to have you with us today. I know we're running out of time, but as, as we close, I want to ask you, what is your biggest hope for the future? What do you see happening within your program? Um, what are some of the, the things that we have to look forward to? Uh, more companies coming up in, in the space sector locally, but for me, what's important for them to become players in the global space economy uh, and not necessarily in the local space economy. From a global perspective, uh, more inclusivity in STEM is something that I'm quite passionate about and more diversity uh, in, in STEM because that allows us to transform technologies and push them forward uh, in such a large leap. And I've, I've personally experienced that and I'd love for us to continue the dialogue of ensuring the diversity and inclusivity in STEM and pushing that forward globally. Minister Alamiri, thank you so much for joining us on State of the World today. It has been an enormous honor. Um, I know that uh, I speak for our staff and our community that what, what an amazing talk and, and thank you for joining us. And thank you so much, Megan, and to the team. It's a pleasure being here with everyone. Thank you so much, Minister. And just to close, uh, I want to end on one last huge thank you. It's an absolute honor to host you, Minister Ella Mary. And um, I want to say another thank you to Ron and to Kurt for joining us to, to kick off this event today. To today's event sponsor uh, who made this possible, Raytheon Technologies, and to today's partners. Um, and I know so many of you who are joining us today are uh, here because of our uh, these great partners that, that made this event possible. Uh, the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology and the World Affairs Councils of America. Um, so welcome everyone joining and thank you again for being here. Once again, thank you so much, Minister Alamary, for this excellent briefing on what's, what's occurring today um, and what's ahead for the UAE space program and the global opportunities that we all have before us. Um, so thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us and until next time.